Hello, everyone. I am so excited. Uh, today, I've got Josh Silver, the co-founder and director of Represent Us, an extraordinary organization working to eliminate corruption from politics, to unrig the system. What a remarkable guy this is. You don't want to miss this episode. Uh, stick around. Welcome to the Your Mark on the World show with your champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. Josh, welcome to the show. Thanks. Good to be here. Golly, yeah, we're thrilled to have you. Really appreciate you taking the time. Tell us, what's wrong with politics in America? I have a question for you, Devin. What's not wrong with politics <laughs> in America? <laughs> You've got a, a government that we're, we're looking at unprecedented, at least in modern history, levels of gridlock, polarization, dysfunction, something that I think is stunning to all adult Americans, uh, I'm 50, I look back, I've never seen it like this. People are scratching their heads saying, what's wrong? Like this feels different than it has in the past. Be members of Congress can't even hardly look at each other, much, much less cut a deal or make compromise and pass policies in the public interest. And what's happened is the American people are starting to correctly figure out that the very system the very system of election and campaign finance ethics laws that upon which democracy is built, that system is broken. So as you look at it, uh, you know, Donald Trump sort of came to power uh, with one of the major drumbeats of his campaign was drain the swamp. Um, liberals have been unequivocal that uh, he's been pouring more uh, gooey water into the swamp. He's not draining it. Um, how, do, how do we fix that? What are the steps we take to actually drain the swamp? Or, or is that the right metaphor? Is that the right mission? What do, what's your take? It's fine, but first let's, let's get some clarity. Donald Trump is the, but the latest of a series of presidents who have promised to drain the swamp or fight big money in politics and fixed elections who have failed to do so. Uh, let's go back to uh, Bill Clinton, who promised on the campaign trail to do something similar and had majorities of Democrats in both the House and Senate for the first two years of his presidency sat on his hands. Barack Obama, same thing, Donald Trump, same thing. If you, give, if you give George W. Bush any credit, at least he didn't even promise to. He didn't do it. He didn't promise. But the fact is, is that both major parties are captured by big money interests. We have an, a system of elections that literally incentivizes polarization and extremism. For example, gerrymandering, which is increasingly understood to be a bad thing, used to not even be understood at all, where politicians in the states are carving up congressional districts into these crazy shapes in order to create partisan advantage in elections such that 86 percent of u.s house races are, are uncompetitive that's a systemic flaw that actually guarantees a lack of competition and extremism because frankly it's the most extreme voters on the left and the right that turn out for elections in the primary election and that's the only place there's competition when gerrymandering guarantees there's no competition in the general, thus forcing, incentivizing politicians to take the most extreme positions. When we vote and it's a winner take all system, it precludes independent and third party candidates from even having a chance to run or else they'll be a spoiler or they'll, they'll ruin the election for someone else. So these fundamental flaws along with the naked auctioning of our democracy that happens every day with big money interests, lobbying Congress and buying laws and policies. Combined, this is a lethal toxic brew that has given us America in 2019 with all of us scratching our heads. What does represent us do to get rid of gerrymandering? It seems so entrenched. What are you doing? Well, what we're doing with gerrymandering, it, it mirrors what we're doing with all these issues uh, that I've just outlined. Now, to be clear, I think part of the reason why you've had me on the show is that all is not lost. There is this burgeoning movement happening, particularly over the last four years, um, and having nothing to do with Trump. This, is, this predated Trump. This 
this simmering, this started happening uh, well before that, of Americans sort of taking matters into their own hands and changing democracy policies at the state and local level. Something that follows the arc of history, if you look back at women's right to vote or interracial marriage, prohibition, while that was a thing, uh, gay marriage or, um, or uh, marijuana decriminalization, issues that were running into a kind of a brick wall in Washington, D.C. And so they took their fight local and they started passing reforms state by state, city by city, until eventually they hit this sort of tipping point and then federal laws were changed in a transformative way. We're doing the same thing. You asked about gerrymandering. Before 2018, only two states had ever passed uh, independent or bipartisan redistricting commissions, taking the power to draw congressional districts away from politicians, putting them in the hands of citizen appointed or bipartisan appointed commissions in a way that makes it much more fair, much more competitive and, and breaks this cycle. We saw five states passed anti-gerrymandering laws at the ballot through ballot measures just in 2018 alone. So now there's seven states and it looks like there's gonna be three or four more states with ballot measures next year. So there's great hope in that issue and other issues all across America where the people are taking matters into their own hands. Yeah, I live in a very lopsided state, live here in Utah. And so we've lived with gerrymandering issues my entire life. We've been very sensitized to it. And I think Utah was one of the five states that passed a ballot measure uh, last year, uh, thanks to your work. So congratulations. Uh, yeah, well, of course. And, and it's that just shows you, too, that this is not a, you know, the sort of the, the, the critics will try to dismiss it. Oh, this is maybe just a blue state thing, or this is just a liberal thing. It's far from it. I mean, over 80% of Americans support these reforms. Another really exciting reform that happened, Devin, was ranked choice voting, which you probably, your, your viewers and listeners have never heard of, yeah. which is an alternate system that exists in eight countries, 12 cities in the United States, and now the state of Maine, which used it here in the United States for the first time ever for federal elections last year, which allows you to rank your candidates in order of preference. And what it does is it ensures that even if your candidate doesn't win, well, your second place vote gets applied to the remaining candidates. It makes it so that independent and third party candidates can run. There's no more so-called spoiler effect, no more picking the lesser of two evils. It's completely transformative. It even fosters uh, moderation and civility because candidates are trying to get your second place vote if they can't get your first. So it's really exciting and we're starting to see that replicate. Just last night, we saw the city of New York, a commission in that city, referred ranked choice voting to the ballot this November for approval by voters. If it passes, it will triple the number of Americans using this alternate system. Yeah. Now, how does that uh, reduce the corruption and increased fairness in our elections? Well, ranked choice voting does that because the problem that we're having right now is that if you're not part of the two party system, now keep in mind, 30% of American voters are Democrats, 27% are Republican, Neither, uh, nearly 50% of voters are now registered independents. People like me who are like, I've had it with having my heart broken by both parties. And you're, a lot of your viewers and listeners can probably relate. Well, ranked choice voting gives us a way to support candidates who think like we do without risking having our vote thrown away. So what happens is you have better quality candidates running who are willing to buck the corrupt two-party system. They are more representative of the people and it ends up bringing in more public interest-minded candidates who aren't part of the machine. And that is absolutely critical because as you probably know, when you do things like campaign finance reform, which we strongly advocate, it's kind of, impossible to completely get money out of politics. It's not going to happen. So instead, you need to look at changing incentives. And if we change incentives such that politicians are incentivized to appeal to the public interest instead of the special interest, so we make it so that public interest minded candidates actually have a path to victory and they run and they win, well, that's where it starts to get exciting. Does represent us? Do you have an opinion on Citizens United? 
Well, we do. We think it's a bad decision. It's the decision back from 2010 that essentially opened up the floodgates to unlimited spending by anybody, corporations, unions, individuals, into politics. There's a lot of people clamoring to reverse Citizens United. We support those efforts. However, it's a long uh, road to hoe. You've got uh, to amend the U.S. Constitution. That takes two-thirds of the U.S. Congress. We can't even hardly get anything passed through the Congress. And then uh, three-quarters of the state legislatures need to ratify that. Now, it's a noble effort. It should continue. Uh, but I wouldn't hold your breath. It's not going to happen anytime soon. Everything else I've described here today can be done absent reversing Citizens United. Interesting. Now, how does Represent Us gather its money? Well, fortunately, we have tens of thousands of small dollar con contributors who give monthly, small amounts, a dollar a month, five dollars a month. We have a handful of major philanthropists. They're all listed on our website, represent.us, if you want to see who gives to us. We believe in transparency. Uh, and a growing number of foundations and philanthropists understand that the issues they really care about, because let's face it, democracy policy is nobody's first it, uh, issue except maybe me and a few hundred other people, <laughs> thousand. But people who care about taxation, who care about environment, who care about education or uh, inequality, uh, these people are starting to realize that their issues are stuck until we fix this. Yeah, that's, that's uh, fascinating. As, as you look back, I mean, you've done some amazing things. Uh, people that recognize you will probably recognize you from the Jennifer Lawrence video you did that gets lots of play on social media, lots of attention. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that has nothing to do with Jennifer Lawrence. But um, what, is, what are you most proud of having accomplished? Well, I mean, I think I'm proud of a few things. One is, you know, uh, we have shown that there is a movement to reclaim American democracy. We get together every year at this event called the Unrig Summit, uh, a couple thousand people for the largest gathering in modern history of people uniting to reclaim American democracy. Um, and I think I'm, I'm most proud of showing the country that there is a movement on the rise that is growing in power and will not rest until we change these seemingly arcane policies around campaign finance ethics and elections until we have a rep truly representative democracy. Now, you're right, we have also managed to get celebrities involved and it's been important. Um, Ed Helms just joined our board, he was from The Office and The Hangover. Jennifer Lawrence is on our board of directors, as is Adam McKay, uh, a, a legendary director and writer, uh, and a long list of others. And I think that's important to creating inexpensive earned media. Those celebrities get a lot more attention than I do. I know you didn't watch the video because of me. Um, but it's exciting and it's unprecedented in this space. But the key here is this. Once you have your light bulb moment, once you realize that the issues you actually care about, that you have seen either frozen or moving backwards for years, that the reason for this is this broken political system, this corruption that grips our country. When you realize that it's not a lefty thing or a righty thing or a democratic thing or a Republican thing, when you realize that this is a systemic flaw that affects the entire system, you can get away from this us versus them, left versus right, false paradigm. And you can recognize that over some 90% of Americans are with you. And they also want to unrig the system that your neighbors, people you see at the diner or at your church, they're going to nod their head and agree with you. This system is really broken and we need to fix it, even if they don't agree with you on other issues. That's really empowering and exciting. And it gives cause for hope because let's face it, we are in a soft civil war in the United States. We are at levels of polarization and tension amongst fellow Americans and our politicians that we have not seen in generations, certainly not since I've been alive, really since Vietnam. And so uh, this is a, this is a, a bit of a, a bright light uh, in an otherwise somewhat bleak landscape. What is the most important lesson you take away from your work in this space? That's a great question. 
Um, one is that the American people are really busy and um, we cannot assume that people are going to have time to understand everything about everything, that we need to simplify it and make it digestible and give them a uh, bite-sized pieces like the Jennifer Lawrence video that you can see at represent.us and give them the tools to take action without, uh, without taking up too much of their time. But if we can do that, there's a study that shows every movement that's had 3.5% or more of their population engaged in that movement or issue has prevailed. And for us in America, that's 11 million people. So if we can get 11 million people to pay attention to this issue, and that could be some of you watching or listening to this podcast, uh, and get engaged at represent.us, we have a hope of, of truly reclaiming our, our government and in in this great nation of ours. Josh, you've talked about why this is important, and I get that it is important. It, it, it is. And I think, you know, your suggestion that the vast majority of people support these principles and ideas, absolutely get it. You mentioned that you are among the rare group of people for whom this is the issue, right? The, the, you, you step forward on that. Why? Why did you feel responsible to fix the system? We all see it's broken. Why did you feel that personal calling? Because like many journalists and certainly many public interest advocates, my goal is to make the world a better place for everybody, irrespective of where you're from, what you look like. Uh, I want the world to be a better place uh, for, for the majority of people. And when you realize that these system flaws are the number one preventor, the number one obstacle to achieving that vision, then you realize that everything else you're doing is pretty much a waste of time. And when you realize that, when it's almost like the matrix, when you take that blue pill, well, there's no going back. I mean, you, you realize that uh, you're gonna be tilting at windmills unless you, you sort of chop at the root of this problem. And, and that's what we're doing with Represent Us. So, you know, folks need to learn more about anti-gerrymandering and ranked choice voting and automatic voter registration and vote at home and campaign finance reform laws and revolving door laws that prevent politicians from cashing out and becoming lobbyists right after they leave office. And these are the root causes of the, of the problems that we're facing. Uh, and, and if you could, you can also go to anticorruptionact.org and learn about the policies that we advocate uh, and become part of it. And it's empowering. And it's something that, uh, that once you've taken that pill, there's no going back. That's great. Josh, what is your superpower? I think it's finding really talented people and putting them to work uh, in a collaborative way and presenting that vision of what we're all working on to the world in a way that's understandable and engageable. And hopefully I've done that with your, your audience today. Absolutely, absolutely. Josh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, it's been so helpful. I know you're super busy and you've got to run, but before you go, would you take just a moment and tell people how they can learn more about your work and how they can connect with you? Best way, Devin, is to go to represent.us on the web, sign the button that says join us and volunteer. We have all kinds of ways to do it, whether you're super busy or whether you really want to put in real time, we are there for you and you'll, we'll provide the on-ramps. But most importantly, get involved. Even if you can't do anything, then, then, then hit the donate button and contribute, but uh, be a part of it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Josh. Again, we, we appreciate you taking the time to be with us and we wish you every success in fixing our broken democracy. Thanks so much, Devin. All righty, let's do some good. Devin Thorpe's mission is to end extreme poverty, improve global health, and mitigate climate change before 2045 by finding and sharing the stories of those who are doing the most good. Thanks for tuning in to the Your Mark on the World show, the Social Impact Podcast. Please subscribe via YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or Spotify. 